Hi, and welcome to part two of Ways to Improve Reading. If you haven't already watched part one, go ahead and look on my YouTube channel for part one, which covered fluency. Now in part two, we're going to look at comprehension. During this video, the objectives of the video are to number one, describe what is needed for efficient reading comprehension, and objective number two is to describe strategies for improving reading comprehension. So before we jump into what is needed for efficient reading comprehension, first let's look at the importance of comprehension. Why do we even need it? All right, so the first reason is the obvious. We need to understand what we read. Now we don't just need to understand subject content when we're in school. We also need to understand contracts, legal paperwork, when we're getting an apartment or buying a house, you need to be able to understand the lease. If you're going to the doctor and they're giving you a prescription with information about the prescription, you need to be able to understand the content of that paperwork. You need to be able to understand things you read on Google about different search terms or medical diagnoses. Anything you read, you need to be able to understand. And once you can understand, you're able to advocate not only for yourself, but also for your family. And it helps in education decision-making, life decision-making, but it all starts with being able to understand written information. So those are some of the important reasons that reading comprehension is important. So let's move on to our first objective, which is describing what is needed for efficient reading comprehension. Now, if we look at this little diagram here, you'll notice the boxes around the puzzle say phonemic awareness or understanding the phonemes of the different letters that make up a language, vocabulary, phonics and word study, and fluency. Now we covered a lot of those in part one. So like I said before, if you haven't watched part one, make sure you go back into my channel and watch reading part one. I will actually put a link to that for you. So since most of the things around the puzzle piece of comprehension have been completed, let's now go into the center puzzle piece, which is comprehension. So the first thing we're going to look at is working memory. Now this might surprise you, but right now your brain is working to remember everything that I'm telling you. So in the memory video, which I will link over here, we talked about all the different types of memory, and one of them is working memory. Working memory is when you're remembering things that are happening in that moment so that you can use it in that moment. So when you're reading a book, reading a passage, reading a page, your brain is remembering all the sentences that came before the one you're reading at that moment so that you can comprehend the entire passage. When you're reading a big huge novel like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, your brain is remembering all of the things that happened throughout the beginning, middle, and end so that you can remember the whole story. So our working memory is very important in order to be an efficient reader. Number two is making inferences. Now when you're reading and you have to comprehend text, once you comprehend the text, you then take what's in the text in order to make predictions, decisions, or to choose if you want to take the red pill or the green pill. <laughs> uh, making inferences is a very important part of being an efficient reader who has good comprehension skills. Number three is monitoring. You want to be able to monitor what you're comprehending. There have been so many times that I was reading textbooks or research articles and I would read like a whole paragraph and then I was like, what did I just read? <laughs> so I had to kind of monitor myself to say, huh, I don't remember what I just read and then I would have to go back and reread. We also need to monitor how much we're comprehending. So sometimes I would read like a whole section and I'd be like, well, I kind of understood this part and I kind of, you know, didn't really understand this part. So then I would have to go back to the part that I didn't really understand and figure out how it tied into the part that I did understand. So it's important to monitor your levels of comprehension. Number four is domain knowledge. What do you already know about the topic you're reading? So sometimes we're reading about a topic we know a lot about. So we're kind of reading like, yeah, 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 I know that, I know that. Oh, that's a good point. And then other times we're reading something that's brand new. And so we have to really pull out our skills for reading comprehension in order to learn more about that topic. But knowing domain knowledge is extremely important and it helps our students, which is one reason why, and I know this is technically a strategy, but as teachers, we should always be pulling on prior knowledge. We wanna make sure that our students pull from what they already know and then add the new knowledge on top of that to make a connection. Number five is text structure. Now, when we look at text structure, these are five main forms of text structure. We have cause and effect, 
Compare and Contrast, Sequence, Problem and Solution, and Descriptions. Now you may know a lot about these already, so as the dominoes show here on the far left, cause and effect is when something happens as a reaction to something else. For compare and contrast, this shows how two or more things are alike and or how they're different. For sequence, this describes things in order. So when you're giving directions or when you're following a recipe, these types of things help you follow a step or a group of steps. So this is considered a sequence type of text. Problem and solution tells about a problem and sometimes says why there's a problem and then gives one or more possible solutions for that problem. And next we have descriptions. Now this is when a topic, idea, person, place, or thing is described by listing its features, characteristics, or examples. Now it's important for us and for our students or children to know the different types of text so that they can see which text they understand and which text they might be having a difficult time comprehending. It could be that your students are doing great with sequence and they're able to follow things in order based on the steps that are described, but they're having a difficult time with descriptions or with cause and effect. So we wanna make sure that students are aware that there are different types of text to help them monitor their own progress throughout the reading comprehension process. Next, we have sustained attention. Now, as I've said before in previous videos, I do have a video on all different types of attention that's not related directly to ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but it's just about attention in general and strategies to increase attention. So I'll put a link to that video right up here. But sustained attention is very important for comprehension. You can be a fluent reader and you can be reading something and you're constantly looking around and then you go back to where, okay, where was I? And then you're reading again and then you look around again because you're bored or something caught your attention sounds or a person calls you or, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm hungry all of a sudden. If you keep diverting your attention away from the task at hand, it's going to be hard to comprehend an entire passage, let alone a whole textbook chapter once you're older and you're reading textbook information or even as a K through 12 student who's reading a chapter book, or you have to read one page of information for an assignment. If your attention is constantly being diverted in other places, you're not focused on the task at hand, and so you need to work on your sustained attention. So now let's look at what you were able to remember. Did you have sustained attention during this video? Were you able to comprehend the things I mentioned earlier that are needed for efficient reading comprehension? If you don't remember, please rewind the video and take a look back at the different components I mentioned that are required for effective reading comprehension. Now let's move on to the fun part, the strategies. So as we're looking at strategies, I know I only went through a few parts of what is needing, needed for reading comprehension, but if I blow this picture up for you, you'll see there are a lot of parts of reading, especially when it comes to beyond just reading and looking at comprehension. So I'm starting at the top and going across to the right, we have predicting prior knowledge, so things you knew before that you can bring into this new information you're learning, connecting information together, questioning, you need to be able to ask questions as you're reading and look for those answers along the way, visualizing or picturing in your mind, imagining what you're reading, inferring, which is comparing and contrasting different characters or different events, determining importance, what's important in this text, what should I highlight, what can I kind of skip over, Summarizing information, synthesizing, reading on, rereading, and also being able to know when you need to reread. Adjusting the reading rate, so maybe you need to slow down or maybe you need to speed up. Sounding out, chunking information together, scanning through pages because sometimes you don't need to read word for word, you kind of just skim through or scan. Oh, that was the next one, is skimming. And then the last one they wrote on here is use a reference. So especially when you're writing research papers, or papers that require you to give evidence of the, the information you got from another source, then you need to go look up other references and add them to the paper that you're writing. So our first strategy is highlighting. Now highlighting is very important because first you need to know what to highlight. And secondly, by highlighting in different colors, you're helping your brain know what to pay attention to. Which information should you really be able to just concentrate on as soon as you look at that page? Now, I personally identify as a visual learner. They say that there is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or hands-on learners, but science doesn't back that we are only one type of learner. 
we're actually all a mixture of those types of learners. And I just personally remember information best when I see it. Now, this is a little embarrassing, but I love to use colors. <laughs> when I'm reading new information, when I'm writing notes, um, anything that has to do with remembering information or studying or creating documents for other people to study with, I use so many colors. This is actually only half of the different color pens that I like to use. But even our students like to use different color pens, different color um, highlighters, and we really need to encourage students to learn how to highlight. And as teachers, we may even want to help them know what to highlight from the beginning. So when I'm helping my students, even my university students, and we're going through class, and there might be like a PowerPoint slide up, and I'll tell them, okay, so this said blah, blah, blah. You might want to highlight blah, 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 because out of this whole slide, that's the most important information. So I kind of help them learn what information is key information, and then what information is describing the key information. But I'm, I try to get them to understand how to highlight topic sentences and how to highlight definitions while they're reading in their textbooks. But we have to teach what to highlight, because I also have friends in high school and university who highlighted the entire page. And I said, well, if you highlight the whole page, how do you know it's important? They're like, oh, it's all important. <laughs> no, that's not gonna help you study very well. And it's not gonna help your brain gravitate towards specific information. So make sure that you teach your students how to highlight and try not to assume that they know what to highlight. Okay, so the second strategy is vocabulary instruction. Now here you will see a list of vocabulary words that are for the Snow Queen. Now this is a book for a lower reading level, beginner readers, but here they have all of the important vocabulary from the book. In order for you to understand the story, you first need to make sure you understand these words. So let me blow these words up again. Now there's words in here that might be a little new to students, such as hob, hobgoblin, hobgoblin. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously that word might have been a little new to me too. But the word hobgloblin or some maybe even reindeer. Reindeer may not be a word that students are used to hearing. There's a name in here which is Gerda and we can help students know that when there's a capital letter in the front that's a proper noun. So it's possible that's either a person or a place. So we can do a lot with the vocabulary here on the side before we even read the story. You can play fun matching games with the vocabulary words and the definition. You can have the students practice spelling these words. You can have them write their own story using these words and then see how close that story is with the actual story of the Snow Queen. But pre-teaching vocabulary is extremely important to help with comprehension. Now here is a worksheet that someone created. And this is just for a pre-reading vocabulary preview. So when students first get a book, maybe they're in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, or even high school, this would be great. They start reading the story or reading the assignment, and anytime they come across a word that they don't know, they write the word on the side, and then they find the definition. So this is a great graphic organizer in a way because it helps students build their vocabulary by each student having a dis different list of words that they can write of what they didn't know. When we provide a list ahead of time, like in this example, some students may have known a majority of these words or several of these words. So they're kind of relearning, which is also fine, but if we want students to really acknowledge what they don't know to help them become efficient learners, then we can have them write the, their own words of words that they didn't know as they were reading. And there's lots of these types of worksheets when you just Google like vocabulary worksheet or a vocabulary template, and you can get a variety of different things. Now we'll move on to number three, which is graphic organizers. And I'm sure you've seen graphic organizers all over, especially when it comes to reading. Now this is a KWL chart, and this is a pretty popular chart, even when I was back, when I was in school, back in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> so K stands for what I already know about the topic. Now I said before in this video that you really want to pull from prior knowledge, because if you remember, some of the key, one of the key components about being an efficient reader and having strong reading comprehension is if you're a domain expert. Now you may not be a domain expert, but let's at least ask our students what do they already know about the topic. Some of your students might actually be an expert on certain topics. Then they can help you more throughout the class to teach the other students the information. Now the W stands for what I want to know about my topic. Now W is probably my favorite part of this chart because not only do we get to 
gauge how excited the students are for the topic, we also get to see their interests. And depending on what students want to know, we can kind of group them based on similar topics that they want to know about the main topic. So we can allow students to work with other kids in the class that they normally may not talk to based on an interest that they have together. And then the final one, when you finish learning about the topic, it is what I learned about my topic. So now they get to tell you what they learned that was new information from what you gave them as the teacher. Let's look at, oh, here's an example of a graphic organizer, a different type. So that was a KWL chart. Now this is a sequence chain. So you'll notice this is more for a story or it could also be about directions that were given. It doesn't have to be about a story, but it has you write the characters, the setting, and then you go through the way that the story took place in order. So you go one, two, three, then you skip down and go over to four, five, six. Now this particular graphic organizer has you follow the arrows, but the arrows are actually a little confusing. So personally, I would change this worksheet to go one, two, three, four, five, six, so that it doesn't get confusing because I'm sure some students on this paper are not gonna pay attention to the arrows and they're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then as a teacher, if they don't pay attention to the fact that the student misunderstood the directions of the arrows, they're going to think that the students didn't know the reading in order. So it's also important to pay attention to the worksheets that we give our students and make sure that they're comprehensible and that they're easy to use. This next graphic organizer says, I wonder, and then it's, what do you wonder before your reading, during your reading, and after your reading? So this is causing students to have to make predictions and inferences about the stories or the information that they're reading. Now in the question mark, it also has the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. So they can incorporate those who, what, when, where, why, how questions into the before, during, and after reading statements. Now for number four, we have active reading. Now with active reading, this is when we encourage students to ask questions, predict what's going to happen, look at pictures that are, if there's pictures in the book, we have them look at pictures and try to guess what's going to happen in the book. We want them to visualize the information as they're reading the information. We want them to try to connect with the characters or connect with the author, connect with the information so that it has more meaning for them. And then we want them to respond or talk about what was read. Now active reading is extremely important for comprehension because just as I showed you all my highlighters before, when we're actively reading, then we make our pages nice and messy. So we not only highlight, but we write things in the margins. Maybe we put post-it notes of really important things that we found from that page or questions we might have, like what's gonna happen next? Active reading is all about interacting with what you're reading. And when I teach students to actively read, especially my college level students, but even my younger students, I have them write next to each paragraph, like a couple words or a sentence on what that entire paragraph was about. Just as kind of like a topic. So this was about um, highlighters. This one was about graphic organizers. This one's about highlighters with graphic organizers. Just so that when they go back to look for information, they have a little tiny little topic, topic sentence or topic phrase for each paragraph and they kind of know what was happening in that paragraph. This is also a great test taking strategy. When you're testing for reading comprehension, I teach students to read ahead of time all the questions that are being asked at the end. Read them first so that when they're reading through they can make notes that, oh, the answer might be in this paragraph because they're talking about what was in that question. The pre-reading allows them to read with intent and they can actively read based on the questions that are going to be asked later on. Now number five is square reading. And you may have heard of this, but square is actually a memorization tool to help you remember to survey, query, and then the three R's of reading, which are read, recall, and review. So notice they chunked the information. Instead of it being called the survey, query, read, recall, and review method, it's called the square method. So that you can chunk the information and remember it better. And chunking was in our, memoriz in our memory strategies video. So looking at this again, when we survey information, you're scanning the text and identifying its structure. Remember we had five different text structures that we went over at the beginning of the video. 
Now, the next one is query. So we want to ask ourselves questions about each section. By asking questions, it helps us remember the content that was in that section. Now for read, recall, and review, when we're reading, you want to read the whole text quickly and you don't stop, even if there's something difficult that you don't understand. Then you go to recall. So now you're going to look back at your query questions. Can you identify with some of the sections to help you understand more? And finally, you're going to review. You want to read important sections again and read these sections slowly. Remember why you are reading. Now this is really important, especially when you start getting bigger pieces of um, informational text because it can get really easy to kind of get lost in all of the facts and all of the jargon and all of the all of the information that is in informational text or expository text but by reading through and figuring out the sections that are important for your assignment you can then go back and read those sections in particular and make sure you have a strong grasp on those particular sections so at the bottom of review it says Take notes so that you can remember helpful information and where you found it. Now, I strongly recommend taking notes with lots of colors and even using your active reading type ideas so that when you go back to find information, you have post-its, you have dividers for the different sections, maybe you have your questions written on the different post-its, you've written in the margins, we are actively engaged. By actively reading and using the square method, it will definitely help increase reading comprehension. Now, finally, this is my favorite. I'm all about progress monitoring. And the site easycbm.com is amazing for progress monitoring for both reading and for math. Now, I will say for math, it is an American-based curriculum, so it doesn't use the metric system. It uses the imperial system. So just a heads up that, that that could be an issue if you're trying to use EasyCBM for math and you're not using an American curriculum. However, when it comes to reading, reading English, reading is reading. So this gives you progress monitoring measures from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. And I'm actually going to explain a lot of that for you right here. For EasyCBM, and you'll notice there are students where you can log in all of your students that you have in your different classes the measures, which would be the progress monitoring benchmarks that you can use to assess the students, reports for each of your students all stored in the same spot, inter interventions that you give the students, and of course there's more resources and then your account. So we're going to go to measures and we are going to look at fourth grade. Now EasyCBM has reading and math measures for kindergarten all the way to eighth grade, but let's just look at fourth grade for an example. So if you look at the fourth grade options, it tells you here in a summary that for reading, they have passage reading fluency, vocabulary, common core standards, common core state standards for reading, and then multiple choice reading comprehension. Then of course there's the math section, but right now we're talking about comprehension. So the first thing I recommend that you do is check to see if the student is reading at the appropriate grade level. So if we're doing fourth grade, you can give one of these fluency measures. Now the fluency measure is only one minute and you have the child read as far as they can in one minute. Then you'll check the, the benchmarking to see if they are reading at a fourth grade level. If they are reading at a fourth grade level, then you can also have them practice fourth grade vocabulary. Here's an example of that. So notice the vocabulary is written in sentences and they have to pick the multiple choice answer for the correct vocabulary. And you can also have the student practice multiple choice reading comprehension. So there are 17 different measures here, and you don't want to give a measure every single day or every single week. You want to wait two to four weeks to give a progress monitoring measure. So let's look at the first one. Now the first measure, as you see here, is a long story called the magnifying glass. My screen isn't letting you see. Okay, it's called the magnifying glass. Now this reading measure has been evaluated to be fourth grade. So the student takes their time reading through this story. And once they read through the story, there's multiple choice questions at the end. So now we can see if the students comprehended what was happening in the story. And we can also use these questions to help teach comprehension skills, such as reading these questions first before they go and read the entire story. 
so that their mind is primed and ready for the topic at hand. Now, once they have finished this task, and same with the um, fluency measure, any of the measures that you give, you're gonna wanna re record their scores. So when you're recording their scores, I can go to enter scores. And you can check whatever they entered for each of the multiple choice questions here. And it will grade that for you to let you know how they did. Now this can also be given online for the student to complete and then it will automatically show up on your end as the teacher. Now when you were doing that fluency measure, you can also enter scores online. So they would read to you for one minute. You can push passage text. So here's exactly what the student is seeing on the paper that you give them or on the tablet that you give them. And as they're reading, you push start here and the timer will go. And you can select if they get words incorrect as they're reading. And then when they're finished, you can change this to last word and you'll click, oh, that was the last word that they read. Now, if you notice here at the bottom, it lets you know the total words that were read during that one minute, how many errors were made, and then how many correct words per minute were read. So you use that information and you can, I'm gonna click reports, because I want you to see the benchmarks. So now you have all of the progress monitoring score interpretations. So you'll see here that the table of contents shows you that they give you the benchmarking scores for all of the levels for reading and math measures. So we're gonna to go to fourth grade because that's what we were looking at. This is kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade. So when we're looking at fourth grade, we were looking at the reading measures. I'm gonna make this bigger. And we try to move it over. Oh, well, let me move it over. So I have to keep it small. Okay, so if we're looking at the reading fluency measures, you'll be able to look at these charts depending on if you're giving the measure during the fall, the fall term, winter term, or spring term. And you can see where the student landed on this chart to see if they're at least at the 50th percentile or if they're at the 75th percentile or higher. Now you want to make sure they're in these black numbers in order to say that they're proficient. You can do the same thing for reading comprehension and for vocabulary. Now it's important to go through the documents that EasyCBM provides because they give you a description of how to administer all of these measures. And I will show you now for fourth grade. If you watch this video, they show you how to provide each of the measures so that you're sure of how to give the measures correctly. So there's really no way to mess up using this amazing website. Welcome back after that informational video about EasyCBM. Hopefully you found that just as exciting and informative as I did and I do. But let's go ahead and see, dun, da, 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 can you describe strategies for improving reading comprehension? We went over several strategies just a few minutes ago. So if you don't remember, please go back, rewind the video and pick out some of those strategies to start helping yourself, your students or your child with reading comprehension skills. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down at the bottom, like and share the video. Everyone needs help with reading comprehension. And I really appreciate those of you who have already subscribed. I'm working my way on up to those thousand subscribers and each one of you helps. So I really appreciate it. So for now, I would like to say goodbye until we have our next video. And our next video will be about should I tell you? I guess I'll tell you. The next video will be about strategies for improving mathematics. I love math, but so many people don't. So please watch this video because I absolutely love math and I hope that it will help you love math even more. So until next time, I will see you later and thank you so much for watching.